I recently rewatched the number file videos on ridiculously huge numbers, like Graham's number and tree three. Just complete brain melting monsters. But this time, one part caught my attention. Is Busy Beaver of a Google bigger than tree of a Google? I think the answer is yes. I think the answer is yes. But it's <laughs> yes. that kind of ballpark, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 certainly, certainly. These are, these, are, these are monsters. These are monsters. And so, I went down the rabbit hole of the Busy Beaver numbers, and oh my god, I'm convinced this is the most mind-blowing function in existence. I found out that no algorithm, even in theory, could produce numbers that keep pace with this beast. And if there was some magic brute force computation of even some small values, then that would involve resolving centuries old unsolved problems in mathematics. And some mathematical systems lose the ability to prove its values beyond a point. I mean, what? This thing, which is just a fixed sequence of numbers, is quite literally a boundary separating the computable from the uncomputable. You'll see what I mean. Now I have to admit, I'm a bit out of my depth here. All I've done really is read the work of Scott Aronson and a few others. So consider this just a forwarding of those ideas and an introduction into the crazy world of the busy beavers. First thing, we need a binary Turing machine. This is an abstract device that acts on an infinitely long tape made up of ones and zeros. The machine has an internal state. The machine then reads a cell and then depending on its state and what it reads, it writes either a one or a zero. Then it shifts either left or right and transitions to a new state. Also, it may halt completing the computation. Now to represent all of the machine's behavior, we use a state table where we have the machine's state along the top and the value it reads along the left side. Also, there is a special halt state. Because there are four states not counting the halt state, we say this is a four state machine. Now for every combination of the state and the value it reads, we have three actions to determine the value to write, how to shift, and what state to transition into. For example, if the machine is in state A and reads a value of zero, then we would look here to determine the actions. In this case, we would write a value of one, shift leftward, and change the state to D. So if we start with an all zero tape and in state A, then this machine operates like this. Now there are a few things we need to know about Alan Turing's invention. First, the Church Turing thesis suggests any computation, that is, any finite sequence of steps applied to some input to produce some output is equivalent to the operations of some Turing machine. That's a bit of an oversimplification, but it's good enough for our purposes. This means all of computation, all algorithms, may be thought of as Turing machines. And if we make statements about Turing machines, we can say those apply to all programs. Any Python function, C++ program, literally anything your computer is doing. And second, Turing proved no algorithm exists that receives as input any state table and any input tape and decides whether the machine will halt on the tape. Such a problem is undecidable. This means there's no general way to shortcut computation. To know if it halts, you sometimes have to run it and wait, and you might be stuck waiting forever, never knowing the answer. One thing worth emphasizing is this says there is no single algorithm that works on all machines and tapes. With some specific machines and tapes, a specialized algorithm might be able to decide if it halts. And now we can ask, what is the busy beaver function, which we'll write as sigma n? First, we consider all n state Turing machines. So think of all possible state tables. Second, we run each machine on a tape of all zeros. Next, we look at all machines that halted. The nth busy beaver number, sigma n, is the maximum count of ones written. So each machine that halted will have written some number of ones over the all zeros tape. Sigma n is the max number of ones written by some machine. The machine that achieves this max is called the busy beaver machine. Let's do an example. Let's say n equals two. So we have a two state table to consider. I'll start by just making up the machine's actions. Now to see what the machine does, we'll show the tape after each operation. We start with all zeros, and then after a right shift and state transition, we have the next tape. And this continues. As we can see, we've written two ones. But could we have written more? Yes. It turns out if we used this Turing machine, 
we would have gotten this tape history, which produced four ones. And this turns out to be the most possible. So sigma two is four. Because this machine achieved the max amount of ones, it's a busy beaver machine. And we continue this process. The busy beaver for three states gives this tape history, which ends with six ones. So sigma three is six. And for four states, we have this busy beaver state table. And that produces this tape history, ending with 13 ones. So sigma four is 13. And five states? Well, humanity has not yet been able to calculate this number. To see what's happening, let's ask, how many end state Turing machines are there? This many. We see that the number of machines grow exponentially with n. So for the number of states we've considered so far, that's a lot of machines to handle. When we had four states, that involved over 25 billion Turing machines. And us smart humans determined definitely that the most number of ones they could print is 13. And that was hard work. The difficulty is in determining which machines will halt. There's no general solution, so individual machines need to be theorized over for years, whittled down to a small group that halts, and ran to produce the max count of ones. And we haven't been able to calculate it for five states since that involves trillions of machines, each more complicated than before. And this struggle barely reflects how truly untouchable this function is. Let's start with the fact that sigma n is not even a computable function. A computable function is one which involves a finite sequence of steps to produce the output from the input. And we don't have that because some machines will run forever and that whole time we'll think that one might be a busy beaver. So there's no finite computation we can do. These are not computable. So you may ask, how can we compute these for any numbers? like sigma four. Well, that's a subtlety. The non-computability comes from the lack of a finite procedure for all n, but for a specific n, which brings a finite set of machines, we might be able to analyze our way to the answer. Okay, it has been shown that this sequence grows faster than any computable function. I'll say that slower. Out of all possible functions, which receive an integer n and use any algorithm to return an integer in finite time, the busy beaver function beyond some value of n will grow faster than it. That's expressed like this. This is absurd. The ridiculously general practice of merely taking steps, that is of processing an input in any conceivable way is damned to lose to this godly series. To really get this, let's take a shot at the king. I'm going to construct a challenger, my own fast growing function. I'll start by inventing some notation. Let's say a question mark means an exponential version of a factorial. So four question mark is four to the three to the two to the one. And we evaluate from the top right downward, giving us about 262,000, a pretty big number from four. Now let's consider four question mark question mark. We know four question mark is about 262,000. And now we're reapplying the question mark, giving us a massive tower of exponentials. 262,000 terms tall. And remember, we evaluate exponents from the top down. So two question marks in and we're already at a useless number. Next, I'll define the dash question mark. It's defined as, if we apply it to four, then that's four with many question marks. How many? We will have four question mark question marks. You remember how ridiculously out of hand things got with only two question marks. Well, now we're going to do that many, many more times. In fact, about 262,000 times. So this is bananas. And let's push it. For double dash question mark is defined similarly, except using dash question marks this time. To be clear, we evaluate this expression from the left. So we start with four dash question mark, which is that ridiculous number I just described. Then we take that number and feed it back into the dash question mark, giving us something beyond comprehension. And we do that many, many times. In fact, we do that an unspeakable number of times. So this is utter insanity. And now, my sequence, my attempt to dethrone the busy beavers is this. So how well does this thing keep up with the busy beaver function? It's not even close. Sure, for small n, my function is larger. But beyond a certain n, the busy beavers are totally out of sight. In fact, at which end does the busy beaver sequence surpass my sequence? Well, we can use some bounds on gram sequence, which is a much faster growing function than mine. To relate gram and sigma, we know this 
and this, which are probably very loose bounds. This makes me guess sigma overtakes my function probably around 10. Just a guess. I wouldn't be surprised if it's eight. The point is we are barely off the kitty slope and busy beaver wrecks my function. And here's the crazy thing. The reason we know busy beaver overtakes my function is because my description of the function ends. By merely specifying a finite procedure of how to produce the output from the input, the busy beavers had me beat. My sequence was computable, so I'm finished. And it wasn't even a fight. And now things start to get really weird and abstract. It starts with the fact that there exists a 27 state Turing machine that halts if and only if Goldbach's conjecture is false. Goldbach's conjecture is one of the oldest, most famous unsolved problems in mathematics. It states that every even integer greater than two is the sum of two primes, and no one in history has been able to prove it. What this means is, if sigma of 27 was computed, the direct way involving deciding which machines halt and which don't, then that would involve resolving Goldbach's conjecture, since we would have declared whether the Goldbach machine halted. If it halted, the conjecture is false. Otherwise, it's true. And something is similarly true for the Riemann hypothesis as well. Now, to be exact, there might be some weird paths to calculating the busy beavers without actually answering these open problems. But that's besides the point. The point is, these numbers contain information about a massive portion of all of mathematics. And it actually gets stranger. It turns out there are true statements like, say, sigma of a thousand equals some number k that cannot be proven in our normal axiomatic systems of mathematics. This is to say, beyond a point, math loses the ability to make claims about these numbers, which is just, what? Now to arrive at this, we'd have to discuss a good number of other concepts, so I'll save that for a follow-up video. To end, I'd like to point to the busy beaver world. Scott Aronson's blog and papers are a great place to start. He understands this really well and points to a lot of other work, like efforts to prove bounds related to Graham's number or bounds on BB6 or BB7. In general, there's glory to be had in constructing massively productive machines with as few states as possible. So people are working on it. And there are real implications for the world of algorithms and the foundations of mathematics. So go check it out if you're as interested as I was. Also, I gotta say thank you to my patrons. It's great to see people supporting me for this weird type of technical content. So thank you to them and everyone else as well. Until next time. The one issue I have with the Busy Beavers is the name. The name is dumb. Sounds like a kid's show. Like, what are we doing?